Hello everyone, I hope you all are doing good and all safe. This is Maria Arfan from West Virginia State University. I am a biology major and junior right now. Um, I will be presenting my research, which is an ongoing project which highlights the effects of pharmaceutical on ecosystem. We will be talking about a process known as bioremediation using Pleurotus ostratus to see if it acts as a biodetector and if it breaks down the pharmaceutical into its metabolites. Let's take a look here. All right, let's talk about what pharmaceuticals really are. So pharmaceuticals are the substances that are used in diagnosis, treatment, or prevention of disease for restoring, correcting, or modifying organic functions. They can be found in products such as medications like antidepressant drugs, psychiatric drugs, or painkillers, or hand and body lotions and ointments. Here are the pictures of some of the drugs that contain pharmaceutical. And they are highly effective and their potential for health is enormous. However, they affect the ecosystem. They affect the feeding rate, reproductive system, and hormonal growth of ecological organisms. There are over 20,000 different types of pharmaceuticals that are classified by the chemical group, pharmacological effect, and therapeutic use. So going back to the history, the first pharmaceutical was discovered in 1546 in Germany. Some of the earliest pharmaceuticals found were anesthetics, morphine, chloroform, and cooking. The pharmaceuticals became common in 1950 when British society created an organization known as Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain. Today, the United States holds more than 47% of the pharmaceutical industries and 6 out of the 10 of the largest companies worldwide. The pharmaceuticals are created in such a way to quickly mitigate, react, and leave the human body without degrading while they're still active, which in turn affect the ecosystem. Here are the pictures from back in history of the pharmaceutical industry. So the pharmaceuticals were found in bike range in freshwater systems, including runoffs and rivers worldwide. The pharmaceutical affect the feeding rate, mating success, parental care, reproductive system, and gender of ecological organisms. They increase the activity in fish, which is basically increase their temperature, their metabolic rate, and requires them to have double amount of energy to swim, produce, act, and stay alive. Here are a few of the uh, organisms that are affected by the pharmaceuticals, as you can see in the ecosystem. Okay, so what is micromediation? Well, it is a process that is used to remove toxins and contaminants such as organic pollutants, pesticides, or metals from the wastewater. It is cheap, effective, and environmentally friendly way. It is a form of bioremediation as it uses the biological organisms such as fungus to degrade the contaminants. We will be using Pleurotus ostratus. Um, also, microremediation has proven to be a game changer in remediating contaminated soils in comparison to other processes such as chemical oxidation, reduction, or precipitation, or exchange membrane filtration. Here are a few of the pictures where microremediation process is used to remove the diesel. So in the previous slide, we talked about bioremediation and how it uses the biological organisms to degrade the contaminants. I also mentioned that we are using Pleurotus ostratus, which is an oyster mushroom, to degrade the pharmaceuticals. Well, before we get into any detail, let's talk about what mushrooms really are. So mushrooms are the fleshy spore-bearing fruiting body of fungus that are produced above ground on soil or on the food source. There are over 50,000 different types of mushrooms as you can see in the pictures and out of those 50,000 the 1 to 2 percent are poisonous and others are used for their medicinal properties as they are high in fiber, protein, iron, vitamin D and B. Here comes the Floridus ostratus which is the oyster mushroom. Well, the reason you're using oyster mushroom is that it is cosmopolitan, which means it is present all over the world. It belongs to the genus Pleurotus. They have large body masses and tough texture, which helps to remove the contaminants. Their cap is shell-like, fleshy with eccentric or lateral stripe. Their color can be white, cream, yellow, pink, brown, or dark gray. Here are some of the pictures of pearl oyster that we grow in the lab. So here are the objectives and I will briefly explain them. So first, we want to successfully culture and maintain Protus ostratus in a controlled setting. 
Second, we want to see if chlorotus stridus can act as a bioabsorbent in the pharmaceutical concentration. Third, we will be doing chemical analysis using the LCMS technique to see if chlorotus stridus can break the pharmaceutical down into its metabolites, where they're effective or not effective anymore. And to determine whether pharmaceutical can be detected using the chlorotus stridus, where it acts as a biodetector. There are a few pictures. So the first picture is of the machinery, LCMS. I will be soon getting trained on how to use it. The second picture is of the resultant graph, which shows the results of the sample. Of course, we will learn how to read this too. The, uh, the other picture shows the tent. It is our control setting where we are growing the Protus stridus. So here is what we really did. And let's go step by step down here. Well, the cultivation of Pleuritus stratus was performed using PDA. The first picture shows the PDA in making, which is placed onto the plates to culture Pleuritus stratus. The second picture shows how the Pleuritus stratus is cultured, and the third picture shows the bit amount of the Pleuritus stratus that has started growing, while the fourth picture, you can see it's ready to go. The other thing we do is that we boil the winter rye to prepare the jars where we sterilize them using autoclave. We wait for them to cool down and then inoculate them with Pleurotus stratus. The jars were placed in the dark until the whole stuff became white. As you can see in the picture, the fifth picture and the sixth picture, where the jar is first just winter rye and the other picture you can see it's covered with mycelium and let's go forward the next thing we did is we prepared our bags to grow the mycelium in we used wood pellets soybean and hot water and we allowed the components to mix well together the bags were autoclaved to sterilize and were allowed to cool down before we actually put the grain spawn in after the grain spawn was, which is our basically the jar, after the grain spawn was inside the bags, we inoculated them with the selected pharmaceutical concentration. Not all of them, some of them were not inoculated to use as controls. And the bags were left to grow in the control setting until the surface became white. And small slits were made into the bags when, the, when it was completely white and the mycelium was, was visible and the fruiting body was encouraged to grow in a controlled system as you can see in the picture in the very first picture on this slide is just the bag prepared to be inoculated and to have grain spawn in the second picture is where we actually have the mycelium already and the third picture uh, shows the same thing and in the fourth picture we can see that the fruiting body which is pearl oyster is already out so upon the growth of the fruiting body, the samples were collected by storing the mycelium in falcon tubes and fruiting body in Ziploc bags. The samples were stored in the freezer for future testing, which will be tested using LCMS for pharmaceutical and their metabolites. Here are some more pictures of pearl oyster pleurotus ostratus, where we have a fruiting body as you can see and the and you can really see the controlled setting here the tent here so the future work the mycelium will be created using a different kind of mushroom such as loin's mane vine cap or blue oyster the second thing we will inoculate the mycelium with a different kind of pharmaceutical third the most important point that the mushrooms will be grown in a controlled setting at the field and runoff here are some of the pictures of me working in the lab with fellow other students. In the end, I would like to acknowledge West Virginia State University for always providing me with opportunities that allowed me to do their research. My mentor, Doug Bright, for always being helpful and supportive. And my fellow students, Jeff Vedra Vera and Fred Quigley for all the help and Hannah Payne for introducing me to the different programs and of course NSF Apps Core which funded this research and research rookies. So this is the end to the presentation. If you all have any questions, any concerns, please comment down below. If you want us to add something or you want us to check something, please let us know. Thank you everyone.